<laughs> well, hey, Byron, welcome to the very last, I'm kind of sad about this, the last Coffee Cast, episode six for the Meekonomics series. Wrapping this up here, this has been an awesome series. I've had, I'm not just saying this, but I truly have had fantastic guests, and we are definitely ending on a strong note, having Jeff Tomlin here, yeah. our student pastor. Well, it's uh, Zach, I feel like we've come kind of full circle with this. I mean, we started so, off the intro to Coffee Cast, and, and we were recording in the kitchen. There you go. It feels like, like a month and a half ago, two months ago, and now we're sitting back down together. Yep. Towards the end of this thing. That's it. Full circle. To come to the table, have coffee because of all the people that, I, that I've sat at the table with. I mean, I've had some strong coffee lovers. Uh, TJ, Jamie, and such. And then it, you know, last week you saw that I'm slowly a cup at a time converting Aaron out of gas station coffee. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that'll ever fully work, man. <laughs> but the one who truly loves coffee as much, maybe even more so than I do, is Jeff. So it is yeah. fitting to finish the coffee cast to make this gospelicious, as we heard last <laughs> week. Um, you know, have a Christ centered conversation over delicious coffee. It's gospelicious. Yeah. We're going to talk about meekonomics. We're going to talk about the merge of meekness and evangelism. I'm really excited about the conversation we're going to have. I yeah. know God is going to bless this, that the Holy Spirit's going to talk through this to bless us, but hopefully, more importantly, bless you. So grab a coffee cup of coffee with us. We're going to be doing some French roast here. Um, tends to be, I think, one of our favorite ways of, of drinking coffee. Might be the simplest, but brings the most robust flavor. Yeah. We're going to pour some coffee. Get yourself some. Strap in. We're going to have an excellent episode six to close out the Meekonomics series. Here we go. <laughs> So the French press, like you said, is is one of the simpler ways to brew coffee. It's it's really um, a very clean, mechanical, uh, coarse grind way to to enjoy a cup of coffee. What I love about French press is that the French press will use a metal filter um, that uh, uses that coarse grind because what it does is it allows you to get a lot access to a lot of the oils in the bean mm. uh, that you typically wouldn't get if you use a paper filter or you use one of those other brew methods um, and really gives you that full flavor. So when we're doing coffee tastings, or at least in other jobs that I've had, mm-hmm. um, we, we use a French press because you just yeah. get a really clean, full flavor. Love it. Because I, I filled this up with hot water um, just before boiling to within an inch of the lip here. Pour it. Now, I, I'd say with, with French press, you probably use your coffee about the fastest of, of other methods. You put you put quite a bit of grinds. I put half a cup in this is what is what this recommends. Um, make sure you stir it so that it all gets in there. Set the timer for four minutes and then slowly press that filter up down to bring the coffee to the grinds to the bottom. Clean cup of coffee right here. And how's it taste? It's awesome. Good. It's awesome. Really light, aromatic. Um, where uh, Where's this coffee from? Um, all right. So I, I haven't gone to all the places, and maybe that's good because that will give us more opportunities for different places the next coffee cast. But I uh, still have that bag of the Square One coffee. This is the, um, oh gosh, the Sus- Sasquatch. Okay. Blend. You, are you feeling that wild? It feels sass- mystical. Wa- mm-hmm. Yeah, a little, little mysterious. A little difficult Big, to find. Big, cup of coffee. Hardly <laughs> photographed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You never can quite get grasp if it's true or not. <laughs> right, um, right, right. Mysterious, mm-hmm. mysterious. So here's our mysterious cup of coffee, and uh, hopefully you have a good one as well. All right, Jeffrey. So we are talking about how meekness puts us in the intersection of evangelism, how that sets us up to present the gospel to other people. Yeah. So at, at kind of surface glance, when I think about the intersection of meekness and evangelism, it feels almost like they're conflicting ideas. Uh, because mm-hmm. in the Western church, uh, we often think of evangelism as this kind of street preacher, loud, outspoken, kind of a little aggressive, a little mm-hmm. offensive mm-hmm. Yeah. kind of method of, of sharing the gospel. I, I think of the idea um, of just kind of powering up with the message, maybe having this kind of zealous and, and really sincere heart uh, to share the love of Jesus with people. Mm-hmm. But oftentimes it comes off as this like really aggressive, whoa, this is way too much, and then ends up on the news, you know, in, in a light that, right. that really right. kind of shed, sheds the opposite mm-hmm. of the message of Christ and meekness. Yeah. 
Um, and so, yeah, the intersection of meekness and, and evangelism is a tricky one. Um, yeah. Really, what you have to do is you've got to look at the life of Jesus, um, look at the Gospels, and say, "All right, Jesus, you got to be our teacher." Which is, I mean, what better teacher right, than, than Christ? Yeah, uh, to really show us how these two things meet. And, and a word that I want to capitalize on there is, is I don't know if you said, it, but offensive. But right. I think of evangelism as offensive. And when you look in the Gospels, who did Jesus offend? It wasn't the sinners. It wasn't the people who really needed to know. Well, that's not true. Everybody needed it. It was the Pharisees who thought that they knew um, God, that they thought they knew God's heart, that they thought that their righteousness was from the law, um, and they needed Jesus just as much as the sinners. But it wasn't the sinners who were living in this blatant sin that were offended by Jesus. It was the religious elite. Right. And, and I, think, I think part of that comes from uh, the idea of, you know, this evangelistic tendency to power up, to um, kind of build up aggression, zeal, mm-hmm. height, volume, sometimes even with, with the way that you're speaking, in order to, you know, press somebody into changing their beliefs yeah. over, uh, over their, over your beliefs, over what the truth of the gospel says. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think, and I didn't talk about it uh, this week in, in my message. I really wanted to, but, but oftentimes you see these kind of, uh, th- this happen on Facebook, right? Mm. You have somebody yes. who shares a, uh, a polarizing opinion. And then you have those armchair warriors jumping on Facebook right. and hammering out their keyboards, you know, and, and I don't know that I've ever seen mm-hmm. a Facebook argument, even with good natured, Christ loving, sincere people power up that leads to a conversation about how beautiful Christ is in unity. Which right. is what he what is right. what she, he's inviting us to, right? Um, and so I think that's where we see kind of a misunderstanding of how evangelism actually works from a Christ-centered meekness perspective. Mm. It's why this message is super important for us as Christians, and uh, and and really with our interactions with our communities, whether online or in person, or our neighbors, even you know. Do you think there's there's a dichotomy here between the need to be right and the need for them to be loved? Ooh, right. We I think a lot of our actions are. We say things on Facebook, we do this, we take up because we want to be right. And and maybe biblically speaking, you are right. But I think Jesus focused more on people being loved than he focused on him being right. I mean, he wasn't wrong in how he loved people. Does that make sense? I'm kind of I'm kind of spitting that out. And, and yeah, no, that's uh, that's actually a great point. I think of um, I think of the woman uh, caught in adultery, right? Right. Um, so she was taken by religious leaders to Jesus. Uh, the rightful punishment for her sins was death, mm-hmm. and and they say, "Well, Jesus, what are you going to do about this?" And Jesus's response was, "You know, he who is without sin cast the first stone." Right. Right. He didn't turn to her with this kind of powered up perspective. Mm-hmm. He he restrained this. Um, and really pop the question in front of them saying, Hey, what, what are you going to do with your own sin? Reconcile, reconcile your own sin mm-hmm. first. Mm-hmm. And then, and then we'll see, we'll see where this leads now kind of fast forward the story and, and Jesus, it says that he was, he was writing something in the sand. We don't know what he was writing, which I think is one of those really cool yeah, moments yeah. where it's like, Oh man, what could Jesus have been writing in the sand at this moment? Because John was so detailed in everything except that. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right, right, right. And, and a lot of scholars debate what he could have sure. been writing. But what we do know is that the religious leaders that brought this woman forward, uh, they started walking away. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was the older ones first. Yes. Um, I think the older I get, the more I start to recognize um, that I'm well acquainted with my failure, my, my weakness, my brokenness. And, and then eventually everybody leaves until Jesus, who was the only sinless one, who literally could have cast the first stone. Mm. And he chose in this meek response, neither do I. I don't right. cast my condemnation on you. Right. You know, yes. go f- it, now go forth and sin no right. more. Right. And, right. and you see this time and time again in uh. Jesus' ministry and his interactions with people who he could have called them by their sin. He could have brought up their failure, their weakness, their, their, uh, the very real ways in which they failed. Mm-hmm. And, and he chooses relationship. Mm-hmm. He chooses to see them. He chooses to call them by their name. He chooses to invite them in and open a seat at the table for them and say, neither do I condemn you. Right, right. You belong here with me at my place, at my table, with my father. 
I, I just I, I love seeing that because I think I think evangelism uh, is something that we really need to, to flip the script on. Um, I, I think that there has been a place in our church's history and in, and in the church currently where where you know some of that street preaching and and tracks do have a place sharing mm-hmm. that message. Mm-hmm. But if you think honestly that you're going to shift the world by a well-worded tract, uh, you're missing it. Um, Jesus changed the world, not through pamphlets that he handed out, but by relationships that he made. Right. Um, it was the, the, those, those intimate relationships with the, the three and then the 12 that he really invested in. And those people invested in relationships and those relationships flourished. Mm-hmm. The church was born mm-hmm. through connection and relational evangelism, not through the, the screaming of a message from a pulpit. Mm-hmm. So Jeff, kind of, I mean, not kind of, but what you're saying makes me think of here in Romans 2, 4, which says, um, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance, right? Not his wrath, not the law, not having the Bible beat over your head. It says kindness, which then brings and I know we've we've talked about this here um, amongst the staff is that so often we forget to let the Holy Spirit work that in that relationship in being meek and being Christ to other people and not bringing to them you know condemnation and guilt and shame for their sins but but love and grace that in those moments that kindness is when the Holy Spirit so often works. And brings us, I don't know, this this attraction, this desire within that person's heart to go, where does this come from? Because whenever we come to people with anger or this self-righteous uh, position where we put ourselves up on a pedestal, people don't want to know where that comes from because it, it offends them. It, it belittles them. It doesn't make them feel welcomed or that they desire to even themselves become that kind of person. Right. Well, and, and I think sometimes... You, you hear the the kind of mantra of, you know, but it's a loving thing to tell somebody that, you know, uh, to make them aware of their failure, make them aware of, they, of the way that they miss it. And it reminds me of uh, one of my professors in Bible school. And one of the things that he said is, is that, um, you know, he responds to people based off of the level of relationship he has with mm-hmm. them. Um, because somebody may, may, may be asking for a, uh, a very distinct response from scripture, you know, something out of Leviticus, or, or they're like, what do you mean by this? Or what does the Bible mean by this? And, and if he doesn't have the relationship with them so that they know that he sincerely loves them and cares about them, then it'll, it'll change his response. Mm-hmm. Um, that kindness that Christ shows us while we were but enemies with God, where mm-hmm. we, we were lost in our sin and broken and, and rebels, mm-hmm. Christ welcomed us to the table mm-hmm. and, and didn't welcome us by saying, you know, here's all your brokenness, fix it before you come. It mm-hmm. was, there's a seat at the table for you. Come sit with me, join at the banquet table of the most high. Right. You have a place here. Now, while we're at the table, that discussion looks like something, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's mm-hmm. not, it's not a, you know, leave all your stuff behind before you come in. It's come in and let's talk about the stuff you're carrying. Right. Right. Um, that relational invitation is an invitation to repentance. Um, and, and I think that we get it, we get it flipped. Sometimes mm-hmm. we want people to, to clean up before they walk through the doors of the church. But really it's, we want the, the broken, the, the ones who are carrying the weight of shame or condemnation on themselves or from yeah. other people. We want our church to be a space where those doors are open to them, yeah. where they feel like they have a place where they can come and sit in the presence of God, feel loved and cared for. Mm-hmm. And, and it's in those relationships that then we can start looking at the life of Christ and say, man, there are some ways we can live better, but, but ways that we can live better, right? Not ways right. that you can live better before you can be a member or whatever, whatever that well, looks there's, like. There's two points, you know, in coming into a crucial conversation. One is mutual respect and mutual purpose. And that doesn't just initially happen. That isn't, that isn't just a given. Um, and that comes in a, in a, in a relationship to establish that. And it's when you realize that I respect you, that I love you, 
Um, and that my purpose, I think, is the same as yours, is that you want to you wanna live in the fullness of Christ. You don't want to be a slave to your city and longer. Once you've, once you've identified that and you've established those two points, you've created this safe place to have that conversation where maybe you do need to identify sin for what it is, where you do need to talk to them about paths of righteousness and how God has called us to live in the scriptures. Right. But you have to first identify that you're for them. Mm-hmm. And that, that you're not doing this out of a self-righteous, well, I'm going to walk away feeling good because I really told that person up. Right. Yeah, well, and, and I, I see that same uh, that same interaction when I'm walking through my journey with Christ, right? Mm-hmm. Like as I give things over in my life to him and as I become, uh, you know, a better Christian, whatever that looks like, mm-hmm. I am still aware of the ways where I miss it. And Christ is gentle with us, mm-hmm. isn't he? Mm-hmm. You know, he's gentle yeah. with us. He's not going to give it to us all at once. You better fix everything or else you're out. Mm-hmm. It's a let's walk through this as a process, as a relationship. Relationship. And, and he he is merciful, but he's also gracious with us. Yeah. You know, he gives us something that we we don't deserve. So there's a distinction there. Mercy is being spared from what you do deserve, mm-hmm. and grace is being given something that you don't deserve. Right. Right. And, and so with with God, as we're getting closer to Him, as we're we're running towards a relationship with Him, He's gentle with us. Mm-hmm. And I think when when we think about it in terms of evangelism. Um, we need to look around to the people in our communities, the people that are on our PTO boards, the people that are uh, our cashiers or maybe color their hair differently or have different opinions on military or different opinions on, you know, gender or or whatever. You, you feel, fill in the blank for what it is for you. But I think we need to be the ones that are inviting people to the table that may not look or act or speak or mm-hmm. think the same as us mm-hmm. and love them them first and say, you're welcome here. You belong here at the table because Christ is doing that for us. Right. Right. You know, again, while we were but enemies, Christ Mm -hmm. invited us and, and chose the cross for us. Right. Are we as Christians self-sacrificing in the way that we are caring for the people that think and look and act differently than us? Even the ones that we would consider enemies that are actively pursuing Mm -hmm. non-Christian values or principles Mm -hmm. in their community. Are we the ones that are saying, come over, come have dinner with me. I want to get to know you. I want to hear you. We have people like Matthew, the tax collector. There was Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector that you... You know, the Jews would have considered them enemies. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because yep. they had forsaken their own people. They were robbing their own people. They were um, working for an working occupying with, force. <laughs> right. With yeah. with Romans, with the Gentiles, um, to get rich. Yep. I mean, literally, they were probably the worst of the worst of Jews. Um, and yet Jesus did not make them change anything about their lives initially when he first came and had dinner. Well, with Matthew, he went and had dinner with him and his his friends here in in Matthew um, nine, and this is what I was talking about: the religious elite being offended. Not Matthew wasn't offended by Jesus, and they're saying, you know, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus says, because it's the sick that need a doctor, not the healthy. Yeah, um, which is interesting because the Pharisees were also very very sick, but they didn't realize that. And then Zacchaeus just says, hey man, I'm gonna drop in. I'm going to have dinner at your house today. Yeah. But you hit you, you hit on Zacchaeus, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, when I talked about Zacchaeus, one of the things that I, I, I think is just so beautiful about that story is how Zacchaeus, he was so excited yeah. that Jesus was in town. He went and he was like, you know what? I've got to do something to see Jesus. And, and he set himself up in a position, got climbing up in that tree, just to see Jesus as he passed by. And he assumed... Listen to this. He assumed that Jesus was just going to pass by. Hmm. He wasn't expecting an interaction. Right. He wasn't expecting Jesus to stop. Yeah. He wasn't expecting Jesus even to look up at him. And yet, you fast forward a couple verses. Mm -hmm. Jesus, like like we thought, was going to come down the same road. Zacchaeus knew the city. He knew the town. And Jesus stopped, looks up. And I think he made eye contact with Zacchaeus and he said, Zacchaeus called him by name. Mm -hmm. Zacchaeus would have had a reputation. Mm -hmm. The people in that town would have, would have known who Zacchaeus is and Jesus would have known who Zacchaeus was. And they probably would have said, Zacchaeus, Jesus doesn't want to see you. Right. Oh yeah. I I have no idea what those conversations would have been, but, but we know that Jesus saw Zacchaeus. He stopped in his, in his tracks, Mm -hmm. 
called Zacchaeus by his name, not by his reputation, not by his, not by his title, yeah. not by his 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 failures, because Jesus knew those things. Right. He he saw to the heart of people, so he knew Zacchaeus mm-hmm. in his in his wrongdoing, and he said, Zacchaeus, I'm I am going to honor you because it was an honor to to be able to host people back mm-hmm. in back in that time. Yeah. I am going to honor you by choosing to to be at your house mm-hmm. and come and, sh- and share a meal with you. Mm-hmm. And, and what it, what happened right after, I love the verse right after that because it shows the reaction of the crowd. The, the reaction of the crowd, it says that they were, they were disgusted. Mm-hmm. They were, they were uh, angry at Jesus yeah. and said, who is this that would go and share a meal with, with, with a sinner, right. with a chief sinner? I mean, he was the chief tax collector. Yeah. It's not just one of the pe- people. Yes. And it said that he was very rich, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, uh, it's funny because Zacchaeus, in his response, he says, "You know, I'll I'll repay the people that I've mm-hmm. cheated four times over." And y'all, he he definitely cheated people out of their money. Right, right, <laughs> you know, it's the reason yeah, why yeah. he was so rich. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's it's just an incredible transformational relationship that happens when meekness meets evangelism. Mm-hmm. What you see is life change and radical generosity out of people that you would have never expected it. Because don't you know that the kindness of God is meant to lead people to repentance? Absolutely. And that's that's a kindness that Jesus shared with Zacchaeus. It was it really was something that that Zacchaeus uh, he didn't earn. In yeah. fact, he he earned condemnation. He earned, uh, you know, uh, rejection from Christ. And yet, yet Jesus saw him, and and bestowed a great honor on him. And it was it was a beautiful thing. Yeah. So let's take this to a practical level, uh, Jeff. How how would you? Somebody said, okay. I don't. I don't know if I can just go out and invite somebody literally to my house. Or is it that? Is it? Do you think it's that literal? I honestly, I, I think this is the challenge for us. I think it's easy to mentally make a space for people that don't agree with us. Mm-hmm. I think it's easy to kind of in a in a uh, thoughtful or an idea way say, oh yeah, mm-hmm. you know, Jesus loves people that disagree with me, or he loves people on the other side of the political aisle. Um, I think that's easy, and that's a cop out. Uh, I think there's a difference between tolerance and engagement, right? I'll, I'll, I'll right. tolerate. I'll, 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 um, I'll give them their right for for their opinion, but I'm, there's still gonna be a wall between us. Whereas Jesus broke all the barriers and engaged people. Right. The- there, it wasn't this kind of mental exercise of openness to people that don't agree with you. Right. It was a, a physical boots on the ground. Let's go have dinner together. Yeah. I, and not a dinner with an agenda, not dinner with, I'm going to use this, you know, hour and a half to make my best meal so that this person will know that, you know, that they, they were wrong in the way that mm-hmm. we disagree. Mm-hmm. I, I think that it's very, very tangible. I think yeah. it's, we need to have an extra seat at our dinner tables. Mm. We need to have an extra space in our home uh, to invite the people in to our homes that disagree with us. I, I think that relational evangelism means sacrifice. Mm-hmm. It means All the sacrifice. It means sacrifice. Yeah. It means it means saying I am going to have an extra five ten dollars. It's more like ten dollars now for on your Starbucks card on your phone, yeah. and saying this money is dedicated to conversations with somebody that disagrees with me. Mm. Somebody on the other side of the political aisle, somebody that has different views on on gender and, and gender spectrum stuff. Mm. It's it's I am going to make part of my life dedicated to an extra seat at the table with somebody that believes and thinks differently than me. And let's let's go to you know people say, well, what, what do I say? You know, kind of what comes to my mind is, well, what did Jesus say was the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God above all else, mm-hmm. and then love others as you yourself desire to be loved. So I think a great question would be, if you're asking, well, what do I say to that person? It's, well, what would you want said to you? Right. Right? Yeah. In that moment. Yeah. If, if somebody was going to take me to their house to dinner who disagreed with me, what would I want them to say to me. I, and I think, I think also it's, it's important to recognize that we are, we've been given two ears and one mouth. Mm, yeah, and good. and really, yeah. we we should be listening twice as much as we're speaking. Yes, um, let's listen. In my interactions with friends in, in different uh, viewpoints, and and I love surrounding myself with people that d- believe differently than me. Um, but what I've found is is that the more often that I speak and kind of 
um, impose my own views and experiences and opinions on somebody else, mm-hmm. the more they shut down, retreat, and right. want to get out of there. Right. Um, the more that I say, help me understand your experience. I want to know your story. Yes. Man, I didn't realize that that was what it was like for you. Um, and not assuming that because maybe I had a story that was similar, or I had a situation that was similar, that it qualifies me to know their experience. Um, I think the invitation and I think the challenge for us as Christians is to listen more often than we speak Mm -hmm. and make space in our lives for people that disagree with us and people that would be considered outcasts walking into a traditional church. And yeah. And and, and to trust the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. To do the work that that so often we think that we have to do, that I need to be the convictor, I need to call out the sin, I need to give them, you know, tell them the path of righteousness. And there might be a time, but I think that time is even perceived through prayer and God affirming in your heart, this is what you need to say to this person. But more so than not, I mean, Jesus told that woman, go and sin no more. He didn't, I mean, as far as we know, he didn't give her a detailed plan of attack, you know, to live a holy life afterwards. But to just trust that God, the Holy Spirit is there too, and that he is working that person's heart. And you are being a vessel through which God is establishing, um, plant, you're planting a seed and you're watering it. But as Paul said, it's God who makes it grow. He makes that seed blossom, I mean, and, and, and grow into, and, into a person who is Christ. Absolutely. Christ and I, I say the same thing to parents that I'm counseling when they're having a hard time with their kids. It's the Holy Spirit's going to fill in the gaps. Mm-hmm. He's going right. to fill in the gaps. So right. the places we we do our best to represent Christ um, to people we don't know or to people that we're trying to trying to have that relational evangelistic relationship with, um, and and we restrain some of those opinions. You know, two ears mm-hmm. and one mouth, mm-hmm. um, in order to show them true, sincere, genuine Christ-like love, and trust that. They may, they may or may not respond the way that we're hoping them to, the, them to respond, but we can trust that the Holy Spirit is big enough yeah. and strong enough that even if we don't see the end of their story, we know that we can make an impact and show them true Christ's love mm-hmm. uh, by our relational investment. Right. Yep. I like that. And, and at the end of the day, letting them know that I am for you, I'm not against you. This isn't for me. This is, this is me, because that's what love is, a selfless, a sacrificial there for the other person right man well i mean i'm excited um that we got to to wrap up here and just like you said bringing some 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 two points that can seem far away from each other but they're not and how it's embodied in christ and the example he gives us in the gospels of what it means to be meek and how that brings i guess it's just crazy to me jeff that we've had for thousands of years christ's example of evangelism which is embodied in meekness, and yet it's so often gone anywhere but meek. And um, I think that's just a, a work that we have in the church to make sure that we bring it back to kind of the basic question, what would Jesus do? Right, yeah, that, that old WWJD, that, old adage. that thing, right? Yeah, right. And I think, I think it's also being prepared um, to, to share our story and how we, how we came to know Christ. And, and share that story in a way that that's honest and genuine mm-hmm. um, but and doesn't push people aw- away right. showing them hey you know what I I came to the table and I didn't deserve a spot either yeah 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 awesome well Jeff thanks for uh, sitting down at the table with me yeah sharing some coffee and um, I know that this was just a really enjoyable time for me I hope it was for you I hope that this whole six episode series of the coffee cast for the meekonomic series was a blessing to you i know that we'll be doing coffee cast again at some point don't know when that will be but we hope that you'll join us as we do next level content for most all of our sermon series in one capacity or another again just to bring the sunday morning teaching to a new level so that you can continue to engage in god's word that it may continue to transform your life into the likeness of jesus We're so thankful that you sat along with us, that you listened to these conversations, and we hope that you will go out and be Jesus to other people as well. God bless.